Connor, thanks so much. All right, I want to bring into the conversation our friend, legal analyst Nima Romani, who we've been relying on so heavily to help us make sense of each of the day's proceedings there in this trial. Uh, and Nima joins me. Uh, Nima, thanks for being with us. Uh, there's a lot going on in New York t uh, tonight, and so we thank you for waiting. Um, I guess my first question to you is this, uh, and we can talk about David Pecker's testimony in just a moment, um, but the prosecution almost immediately, right off the bat, uh, started uh, with Michael Cohen, and then the defense almost right off the bat started with Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen was not a witness today. Why did the defense and the prosecution feel the need to preemptively, you know, bring up the very existence of Michael Cohen, his relationship to this case, the defense going so far as to cast dispersions on his character, saying that he is a proven liar, he's a convicted liar. Why all the preemption on Michael Cohen before he even takes the stand? Andrew, this case comes down to Michael Cohen. He is the star witness. And even though it's about a hush money payment to Stormy Daniels, in one way, the defense is right. It really doesn't matter whether the affair happened or not. The question is, was the $130,000 paid and was it booked as a $420,000 legal expense? That's the false business record. And of course, if it was in furtherance of or to cover up another crime, such as an election fraud or campaign finance violation, that's how it becomes a felony. And of course, we also know that Michael Cohen is a convicted felon and an admitted liar. So the prosecution is trying to um, corroborate his testimony with independent evidence, like the recording related to Karen McDougal, and the defense is going to go after him at every possible turn, including during today's opening statements. So, Nima, you know, the defense says money was paid to protect Trump's character, acknowledging the payments were made. So, um, you know, is Todd Blanche and these other lawyers, are they doing the work of the prosecution for them? I ask that because do you have to establish, if you're the defense of the prosecution, that the payments were actually made for this purpose? Well, I think the defense is going to lose credibility if they argue that the payments were never made. I mean, Donald Trump did sign those checks. So, I mean, that's something that if he were to deny the jury could easily say, well, I'm going to reject the defense theory completely. So I think that's an admission that they had to make. Now, the question is, what was the purpose of this payment? During the defense's opening statement, they said, well, this was a non-disclosure agreement, and there's nothing illegal with a hush money payment or a non-disclosure agreement and a payment related thereto. And they're absolutely right. The question is, how was it booked? And that's why I think the defense's accountant, that's going to be a key witness in the case. And that's something that was alluded to during the defense opening. Trump is going to say that I just signed the check. I'm not responsible for how it was accounted for. That's on my team. So I think okay. whatever that witness says, that may make or break the case. Yeah, because I, I think I keep asking you this like every time you come on. But it's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, you know, why were the payments made? So does that come after you establish that actual payments were made for a specific reason? Well, I think we all know the payments were made. And today, based on the defense opening, they're going to agree to that. That's something that they're going to essentially stipulate to. The question is, why were the payments made? Did the affair happen or not? And frankly, it doesn't matter. But Trump was trying to protect his family from embarrassment. That's what he's going to say. He, that's why he killed the story. There's nothing unlawful with that. And he's going to say that the way it was booked, it was booked that way by the accountants and not him personally. He's, not, he's going to say that I wasn't responsible for the accounting. That was on my team. So it's going to be interesting to see what the prosecution does to rebut that. That's why they're talking about this conspiracy involving Pecker, Cohen, and all these phone calls and communications with one another to show that Trump knew that the payments were unlawful and they were booked unlawfully as well. So the defense did say that. I mean, to your point, they said this today. They, they claim Trump had nothing to do with the payments. Um, and so you just kind of elucidated for us, you know, how that line of inquiry and that argumentation might play itself out. You know, even if Trump made someone make the payments, i.e. Michael Cohen, uh, did he still order those payments to be made? And if so, if they can establish that, uh, is he culpable for what he's being charged with? Not necessarily. If Trump directed Michael Cohen to make a payment to Stormy Daniels to keep her quiet, that is not unlawful by itself. It's really those false business records. So 
you know, we're talking about this case like it's the Stormy Daniels hush money case, and it absolutely is. But really the crime isn't the payment itself. It's how it was accounted for. If you wrote it off as a business expense, a legal expense of that $420,000 payment to Michael Cohen, the defense is going to argue that that was for legitimate legal expenses and it was booked accordingly. Or if it was booked incorrectly, Trump had nothing to do with it. So it's really the false record that's an issue in the case, not the affair and the payment related there too. All right, so uh, we're talking about all these payments. Uh, let's talk about what DA Alvin Bragg is alleging the payments uh, were for or kind of the in-kind contribution they were intended for. It was 2016. It was a presidential election year. Donald Trump was the presumptive Republican nominee. D Trump's defense team said this, that there's nothing wrong with influencing an election. I mean, isn't that going to be the hardest part for Bragg to prove that these payments influenced voter behavior in the 2016 election? I mean, how do you do that? It's a very hard argument, and that's the most challenging part of the prosecution's case. I think they're probably going to be able to prove that the entries were booked incorrectly and they were fraudulent. The question is, can they tie it back to Trump? But let's say they can. Getting to that next level, saying that these payments were made to deceive the American public, to uh, perpetuate election fraud, that's a tenuous legal theory. And we've talked about the lawyers on the panel, the two of them. They might view that, and frankly, the lay jurors as well, with some skepticism. That's okay. why you see the prosecution. You're really trying to show this conspiracy. And I really think that Karen McDougal recording, if it comes in, even though we're talking about Stormy Daniels, not Karen McDougal. But if we see this pattern and practice of Trump making these payments, knowing about them, recording them unlawfully, and then if the prosecution can prove that this was all intended to deceive the American people, that's their only chance of getting felony convictions here. I see. You know, let's talk briefly about David Pecker. How was he, in your view, as a witness? Was he reliable? Uh, you know, I think a lot of our viewing public knows of the National Enquirer, this very tawdry tabloid. Well, he was the former publisher of that, and he took the stand today. Uh, how do you think he did? Is he a good witness? Well, he's not the best witness, and frankly, I wouldn't have started with him. He only testified today for about half an hour, and it's going to continue tomorrow, and really the cross-examination. This is why I don't like Pecker as the first witness. I understand the need from the state's perspective to start the case chronologically. And Daniels's team apparently reached out to Pecker and the Inquirer, and that's how this whole thing started. But I don't like relying on witnesses first who have participated in some alleged criminal activity. Oh. David Pecker is testifying pursuant to a grant of immunity. Right. I like to sandwich those witnesses between witnesses that are a little bit more credible. I probably would have started with a law enforcement witness or some other type of witness because the cross-examination is going to be very aggressive because the defense is going to argue, like they did in their opening, that Pecker is testifying the way he is because he's been pressured and coerced by the government and he has immunity, and that he's doing so to sell more magazines. So we'll see how he holds up tomorrow during cross-examination. You know, uh, Nima, lastly, you and I were discussing on Friday um, this what's known as a Sandoval hearing, uh, and the hearing took place on Friday. Uh, Judge Juan Mershon was going to issue uh, the result of that hearing, his decision. Today, he did that. Uh, what did he say on the Sandoval matter? And remind us what that is. So Sandoval is a New York case that says if a defendant testifies, can they be cross-examined or impeached with other legal matters? So in Trump's case, I expect him to take the stand. The question is, can he be asked about the Gene Carroll defamation trial, the New York civil fraud trial that just transpired, and some of these other legal cases to argue that he's been less than truthful in court proceedings. Now, there's always a risk here because you're bringing in all these collateral legal matters. You're talking about other cases. It can distract the jury. It can be prejudicial. But in a big win for the prosecution, Judge Mershon said, yeah, most of this stuff is going to come in. So if and when Trump takes a stand, he's going to be asked about all these other cases. Now, I'm sure the former president will have an answer for each and every one of those, including the alleged violations of the gag order. But it seems like anything's fair game during cross if Trump takes a stand.
Yeah, and of course, let's uh, look forward to tomorrow. Uh, Judge Juan Mershon is going to be holding a hearing on whether Trump violated the gag order. Uh, he's looking at potentially a $3,000 fine. How do you think Mershon will rule on that? Because you can make the argument, and we're going to show our viewers what Trump said after court was all said and done today. Uh, he really went after Michael Cohen. Michael Cohen's a witness. Witnesses are included in the umbrella of the gag order. I believe the judge is going to sanction Donald Trump and fine him. I think the fine is going to be in the thousands of dollars, not a whole lot of money, but it's just going to be the first step to try to control Donald Trump outside the courtroom. Frankly, I don't think Donald Trump can be controlled by anyone, including his lawyers or the judge. So this may be just the beginning of a gag order violation hearing. This may become a repeated theme in this case. Yeah, and to your point on our last uh, point about the Sandoval hearing, all of that is only operative unless and if Trump takes the stand. Now, so if he does take the stand, the DA's office can, after this ruling, want to remind the viewers, uh, they can ask about the civil fraud lawsuit and they can ask about the E. Jean Carroll lawsuit, both of them uh, as well. So that's going to be really interesting. Uh, the judge ruled that that can be brought up, but we're just getting started, uh, Nima. What are you looking for tomorrow? Yeah, of course. And Trump, like any other criminal defendant, has absolute Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination, right to remain silent. He doesn't have to take the stand, but the reason I think he will is because he's talking to reporters every single day outside that courtroom. And you know, he's talking to the American people and undecided voters, not necessarily just jurors who are going to decide his fate. So it's going to be interesting to see how this case progresses. Obviously, we know that Michael Cohen is the prosecution's entire case to the extent they can corroborate his testimony he'll be huge so everything until then is really the undercard he's the main event so that's what we're waiting for all right uh, Nima Romani as always uh, thanks for sticking around with us today always appreciate it talk soon of course thanks for having me